In 17th century France, poverty and suffering were the daily norm for the uneducated. Amid this poverty, opulence and wealth were reserved for the privileged few, the educated privileged few. Into this time and turmoil came Jean-Baptiste de La Salle. He was declared a saint in 1900 and named patron of all teachers in 1950. His spiritual and educational innovations have influenced educators and the organization of schools for over 300 years. Today, the spirit of De La Salle inspires the actions of tens of thousands of La Salian educators in over 80 countries. Jean-Baptiste de La Salle was born into a wealthy family in Reims, France in 1651 and was destined for the priesthood at an early age. At 16, he became a canon, a position of high honor, at the Cathedral in Reims, located a few blocks from his home. As with all of us, there would be turning points for de la Salle, turning points that would shape his life journey. The first one came at age 20, while studying at a seminary in Paris. Both of his parents died within a year, leaving him in charge of the family estate and his younger brothers and sisters. He did not leave the priesthood, but he did return to Reims where he continued his studies and cared for his family. Seeking spiritual guidance, de la Salle chose a fellow canon at the Cathedral of Reims, Nicolas Rolland. This relationship would lead de la Salle to his life mission. Divine Providence was placing another path before him. At the age of 27, de la Salle was ordained into the priesthood. Two weeks later, his spiritual advisor and friend, Nicolas Roland, died. Roland had named de la Salle executor of his will and protector of the Sisters of the Holy Child, a community of women formed to educate underprivileged girls. As with all his responsibilities, de la Salle took up the task with serious resolve. One day, as de la Salle was visiting the sisters, he met Adrien Niel, a layman who had come to Reims to establish a school for poor boys. During this chance meeting, Niel explained his intentions to de la Salle, who offered to help Niel make the necessary contacts and suggested that Niel stay at his home. Through these contacts, Niel established several schools in the area, with de la Salle providing assistance when he could. Such early influences as Roland and Niel would lead de la Salle, in his own words, from one commitment to another, as he assumed, at first unwillingly, more and more of the administrative responsibility for the schools being established by Niel. He gradually trained Niel's teachers under his own roof, increasing their competence and dedication. This action had a profound effect upon de la Salle. He was now living with men who came from an entirely different level of society than the aristocracy with whom he was accustomed. But de la Salle was able to guide the teachers in their spiritual growth and to help them improve their professional skills. Slowly, he shaped them into a community of men whose vocation it was to serve as Christian educators. In 1684, during a severe famine, de la Salle resigned his canonry and distributed his wealth to the poor, becoming, like his teachers, totally reliant on God's divine providence. De La Salle's own spirituality and his intense commitment to God's calling more and more animated this young community of educators. Next came the years of De La Salle's first professional commitments and his early successes and failures with the schools. He witnessed the spread of the schools to the Paris of Louis XIV and experienced the loss of many of the first brothers who joined him through illness and overwork. As de la Salle entered his 40s, the original band of teachers was becoming a talented community of educators. He provided them and the newly established schools with structure, rules, and textbooks. 
He authored many important works during this time. They were based on his reflections and on his life experiences with these fellow teachers. As with all new enterprises, success and failure continued. But De La Salle was convinced that his path was the will of God in his regard. De La Salle's schools were called Christian schools, and the community of educators was called the Brothers of the Christian Schools. These schools gradually evolved into remarkable learning environments that attracted and welcomed all students, especially the poor. And their reputation spread so rapidly that soon even the children of the upper class began to attend. Some saw the Christian schools as dangerous competition. Other groups of teachers, especially the writing masters, along with the masters of the little schools, attacked them with lawsuits and even occasional vandalism. De La Salle and the brothers who started with him courageously struggled to create a system of education that would help the underprivileged, the children of the poor and working class, overcome the problems associated with their lack of education. However, pressure from the outside brought the schools to near collapse in 1691. In response, De La Salle and two ardent colleagues, brothers Gabriel Drolin and Nicolas Vouillard, made a special private vow to persevere even if it meant living on bread and water. With each ordeal, the Institute became stronger and stronger. The communal vow of association became a key element of the brothers' identity, both in their work and in their life of faith. The Christian schools gradually became known for their effective education and for the special care offered to each individual student. The schools were animated by the spirit of faith and zeal for the education of youth. Through the teacher, God became a real part of each student's life. Students and teachers were continually reminded of God's presence. The Christian school was based upon a deep respect for the life of each individual student. According to De La Salle, God called the brothers to touch the hearts of their disciples to inspire them with a Christian spirit. De La Salle reminded the brothers that students learned more from their example than from their words. Social status and other distinctions between students became unimportant. The Christian schools were places where students from all classes of society felt at home. And they proved to be quite effective with a curriculum that emphasized practical education. Reading was taught using a book, say, on politeness, so that the students would learn about social graces while they learned to read. Arithmetic might be taught as an aid to record-keeping. Or, for the sons of sailors in northern France, students were taught navigation. This was an education that prepared students for a productive life according to their talents and circumstances. Thus, De La Salle and the earliest brothers created a comprehensive educational system that came to be described in the book, The Conduct of the Christian Schools, providing exact instructions for classroom organization and teacher behavior. To this day, this book is widely recognized as a classic teacher training text. The Christian schools insisted that faith and religion be fully integrated into the students' lives. Contrary to the custom of the time, whereby many students went to the parish church for religious instruction, the Christian schools taught religion in the classroom right along with other subjects. Students learned the truth of their faith in a personal manner. The brothers engaged in their educational work together and by association. They shared a common lifestyle, supported each other in their efforts, and served the school as a unified body. This commitment linked every action to that of their brothers and to God. 
The teachers in the Christian schools were ministers of grace called by God to announce the good news to underprivileged youth. The vocation of teaching, which was once looked upon as a lowly task reserved for the poorly skilled, had been elevated by De La Salle and the brothers to one of the highest vocations in the church. Finally, the Christian schools collaborated with parents in the education of their children. They made clear to the parents what was expected of them, such as making sure their children attended church and school regularly. Lasallian educators today struggle with many of the same needs that De La Salle faced 300 years ago. Young men and women desperately seeking meaning in their lives, along with the skills to succeed in society. Just as De La Salle realized in late 17th century France, Lasallian education must continue to be based on a deep respect for each individual student and a deep love of God. Lasallian schools must be places where students meet competent, caring teachers. Teachers who assist them in encountering God, the one who calls them by name. Teachers who help prepare students to take their proper place in church and society, to serve others, and to meet the challenges of the day.